I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello, friends. Today is Saturday, January 15th, 2022, and this is episode 154 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. And I just wanted to ask for those of you who have not left a rating or review for the podcast, please do so um, on Apple or Spotify, or if there are other places you can do it, let me know. I'm not sure, but I would really appreciate it. And it always helps the show. So this week's best thing was we did the cover reveal for Savage City, which is my next book coming out March 31st, 2022. It is Paranormal Romance. I am self-publishing it, and it's my first self-published book in a really long time. So uh, I did the cover reveal with Frolic, the website that the podcast is a part of. It's a romance-centric website, and then uh, did the social media reveal yesterday as I record this. So the feedback has been great. I, I adore this cover. I've been in love with the cover. If you're a longtime listener, you remember when I first saw the cover, I think it was back in October. I've been sitting on this since then. Super excited to finally share it. I've got the pre-orders up, so that is done. I'm still doing the print stuff, the print pre-order, um, but ebook pre-orders are up. And everything is set for Orange Sky, who are doing the audiobook, to release it on the same day. I don't think there's going to be a pre-order for the audiobook. I'm not sure if that's a thing, but I think I'll just get the links on launch day. So that is really exciting. And yeah, starting that process, getting together a marketing plan, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. But it was really great to see people's reaction to the cover and that they're seeming to like the description and the tropes. And I sent the first chapter to my newsletter. Uh, this week. So I'm, I'm probably going to do it again to catch any new people and the people who didn't open. So little marketing newsletter tip. I use MailerLite for my newsletter. And usually I use the feature that is the auto resend. So I send it to my, my list. And then two days later, I send it to everyone who didn't open. Now they're changing things with how, like with the technology that they use to figure out whether someone opens an email or not. But I always capture another 15% of people who didn't open it the first time. This time, instead of doing that, I used the A-B split testing to test my subject lines. So what it does is it sends it to um, 20% with one subject line and 20% of the list with another subject line. And after two hours, the subject line that had the most opens gets sent to the rest, the other 60% of the list. And that was just something different to try. Um, I'm trying to do a little bit better with my subject lines. I think the one that won was, it had the word dragons in it. I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but that seems to be, um, people like dragons. I like dragons. That's why I wrote about dragons. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, so I'm going to manually do the auto resend, which is not auto at this point. I'm going to manually resend. I'm going to create a sub list of the people who did not open the original email and then send it to them probably today with the new subject line. So yeah, just that's how I'm approaching this newsletter thing. Um, I probably, I'm thinking of stopping doing the auto resend because of the big change. I think it was Apple that changed, um, they're no longer using the same method to track opens, which means that, you know, we're just not gonna know who's opening who's opening the letter, I mean, the newsletter. Now, I don't clean my list anymore, which means a lot of, there's a lot of conventional wisdom, or there's a strain of, of advice out there that says to clean off the people who don't open your emails. And then there's other people who say, um, don't clean them. You know, they're still seeing your subject line. You're still in their inbox. They haven't actually unsubscribed. So sometimes, and it's true for my own personal behavior, there's a lot of uh, newsletters that I'm subscribed to that I don't actually open, but I've been on them for years. I see the subject line. Every time I see that person in my inbox, I'm reminded that they exist. And occasionally I do open the email um, or, you know, like there's musical artists like I'll, I'll find out oh from the subject line they have a new album out or they, uh, an author has a new book out i don't necessarily need to open the email i can actually go to itunes or spotify or kindle and buy the thing now that i know that it exists it is saving me a step to click on their email and let them know that i've opened it um but that doesn't necessarily mean that i am cold as a audience member for them 
it, it doesn't mean that I'm not paying attention. It just means that I get a lot of emails. So I don't clean my list. Um, MailerLite is pretty inexpensive. I have, I'm on the plan where you get up to 5,000 and I don't have 5,000 on my list. So uh, until I get to the point where I have to pay more, then, you know, that's when you start thinking about cleaning the list when it's like when they're, when they're going to cost you more money and you're not sure that those people are actually paying attention to you. And I understand that. But I also understand the other side of the argument. And currently that's where I'm landing in terms of my newsletter philosophy. Anyway, writing update. So we are working on the 1830s project, which is going slow. My new goal is two chapters per week. That would put me at about eight chapters by the end of this month, which is the end of act one, which is my goal. I feel like that's gonna be about a hundred pages. So this is the project that I'm writing the proposal, which is the first hundred pages of the book so that we can then sell it. That is actually, you know, a large number of pages for a proposal, but since this is a collaborative project, that was what was requested. And they think that that gives a better chance of selling, like the more people see that you have, um, it's even even stronger chance of selling and it's an even stronger chance of selling for a good advance. So that's what we're doing. And um, it's just going slow. This week, I was moving forward. I got through chapter three. My goal was chapter three and four. I'm going to be working on chapter four today after I finish recording this because... I got, I was researching. I realized for this chapter, I need to really dive into this magic system and I need to really know the mechanics of it. And I had to create that. You know, I, I had the broad strokes, but I didn't have the details. So for me, that means sort of going back into the research. I'm basing it on something real, but I'm fictionalizing it and, you know, fitting it into my worlds that I've created and these characters and these themes and the tone and all of that. So yesterday was about research and I did start doing some writing and I, I, I had the fast draft, which was just bonkers. Like I was just like, and they're shooting magic out of their fingertips, which I knew I wasn't going to keep, but it was just a way for me to get that fast draft complete. And so I can move on to the revision stage where I would figure it out, which is now. So now it's future. Leslie has to figure these things out. And I wanted a really grounded system that is both unique to me, but also honors the the real life tradition that I'm drawing from. And I think I'm ready to actually dig back into the writing. I came up with something that I like. I think it will mean going back into the previous chapters and tweaking some things because we saw a little bit of the magic in previous chapters, but now this is like a bigger, like a magical fight, essentially, like an altercation between two parties using the magic system. So I had to just dig into it. And I've, I've accepted that this is a, a two chapter per week book. And even then, I've only gotten one and a half chapters done. The week's not over. My week ends on Sunday. So I'm writing today. We are expecting snow here on the East Coast tomorrow. So we'll see. I might have to write tomorrow. I, I try not to write seven days a week because it does tend to tire me out. But also, I really just, I was moving slow this week, like slower than slow. And I want to get this moving. Lots of other things to write, so I have to get these projects done. But overall, that's been going well. Plotting for Orbit Book 2 is moving forward. I actually, it was interesting. I was doing the research for this other book, and it led me to a concept that I could use for Orbit Book 2, which I'm plotting right now. And so I had to take a break. That was part of the other slowness. Like, I took a break. I was like, let me make these notes on this thing that I discovered um for this book I'm not working on at this moment and uh yeah that was it was nice but it was also a diversion but it means that I do have more ideas coming I'm clarifying I talked it through with my writing partners in the morning I talked it through with my brother who always helps me clarify my plot and my characters you know being an actor he has a really good idea about character and he's always asking the questions that I don't have answers for <laughs> like what do they want and why I'm like yes that's a good question I should figure that out so everything's moving forward 
I wanted to let you guys know about a new author podcast that is that has started. It's called Real Talk for Writers. It's by author Talina Winters, who is a listener to this show. So shout out to Talina. I will link to it in the show notes. Um, she's like a renaissance woman. It seems she does a little bit of everything. So I think she has a really interesting perspective. I listened to the first episode. And if you like this sort of format, a behind the scenes look at an author and what they're doing and thinking about, then check out Real Talk for Writers with Talina. So my other task is um, figuring out marketing for Savage City and figuring out what I want to do, like combining or finding that that overlap on the Venn diagram between what I think might work and what I really want to do and by what I want to do, what I won't hate doing. I talked about this in my mastermind last week. It'll probably be a topic at this week's mastermind uh, just because some people love marketing. I'm not one of those people. And also, there are a lot of constraints on my time. So I have to really pick things that aren't going to drain me, that I can do in the time allotted, and that I think might work. And you know, paranormal romance is a tough nut to crack. It's extremely competitive. There are like a bajillion paranormal romances published every day, it seems like. Uh, Most of them are in KU, or a large portion of them are in KU, Kindle Unlimited which gives you advantages, but I'm not going to put any of my books into KU because they have to be exclusive on Amazon. And I'm really committed to being wide, especially since all of my traditionally published books are wide and I really have gotten a lot of support from libraries. So I want to make sure that I have books that are available for people in libraries. Not being in KU is sort of like a tick mark against me on the Amazon platform, not publishing fast is another tick mark against me. There's there's obstacles in those ways. So I just have to lean into what I'm good at, what I enjoy, what I don't hate, and um, do my best. And it's true. That's not the only way to do it. There are people out there who are really successful selling a lot of books, um, being wide. Um, there are people really successful, slower writers. It's just not the norm. It's not... Um, like I think those people are probably outliers, as far as I know. And... You know, maybe I can be another outliner, but I, I know that I have to do what feels right to me. And I'm going to put in place systems so that I'm doing something every week, whether it's um, a social media post, some sort of ad or boosted post, um, posting in a Facebook group, doing a giveaway. I have a list of potential ideas and I'm going to schedule them out week by week post-launch, I guess pre-launch to a certain degree, but also post-launch and see what I can do, like build the machine that will do the thing, which is promoting the book and then just hit it every week. And, and that will be the goal that I check off. And if I've done that, then I will feel good about my promotional activities and separate that from the outcome of the sales and the numbers, which can be very stressful. And, um, I'm really trying to really reduce stress as much as possible. So I still have to sort of, I've got like notes written. I still have to sort of put it into an actual plan and a schedule. And that is something that we'll be doing over the coming weeks. But as far as actual production, I have ordered a print proof from Barnes & Noble. For the print, I'm going to Barnes & Noble, draft digital print, and of course, Amazon. And we will see how that works. I don't, did I order a proof from Draft Digital? I'm not sure how that works. I can't remember if I did that or not. But um, yeah, proof copies. I haven't done the Amazon yet. I've got a whole list of things in terms of replacing the cover. Now that we've done the cover reveal, I can upload the cover to the various retailers because they are currently showing the coming soon cover and uh, all that kind of stuff in addition to actual promo. So that is moving right along. I just have a big long list of things to do because when you're self-publishing, there's always a a big long list of things to do. I saw this article in Publishers Weekly by the CEO of Hachette Book Group, Michael Peach, I think. And it's worth looking at because I'm always interested in seeing sort of the, what traditional publishing says and how it differs from what uh, self-publishers are saying and just the different views in the industry. The article is called Michael Peach Looks at Publishing's Near Future and, you know, basically just some ideas on the future of publishing that books are essential. I think so. Hopefully you think so. Readers will find the books that they want. 
He says that number three that I wrote down is that publishing is portable. And he called this unexpected. The fact that because of the pandemic, um, you know, big publishers have realized that people can work from home. That's what he means by publishing is portable. And calling it unexpected is hilarious because, you know, indie publishers, well, first of all, small presses have been doing this on a smaller scale for a long time. But indie publishers are, we're doing everything, you know, from our bedrooms or wherever we are. And uh, it's, it's always been partable. So calling it unexpected is a little bit hilarious to me. He says that consolidation isn't over because the big six are becoming the big five. So what are they going to call Penguin, Random House, Simon & Schuster if that deal goes through? No clue. Online sales will keep growing. Print books are here to stay. And so are bookstores. New marketing skills will become essential. And he says, quote, our ability to speedily join and influence social media conversations will become even more crucial. I wonder at traditional publishing focusing their marketing on TikTok, which seems to be happening a lot. That doesn't seem like the best idea to me. I mean, TikTok sells books amazingly, but it's completely organic. You can't game the system there. And um, I don't know that they understand that, which is concerning. So yeah, he's got some other points in there. Um, worth a read, I'll link to it in the show notes. Also, author and Substack writer L. Griffin has a new article on uh, what if we fund artists the way we fund startups? Angel investments could fund the next renaissance. So she has some interesting takes here about using a combination of like a Patreon type thing with venture capitalists as investors in your work. So say you get someone to invest a few thousand dollars, and then they get a percentage of the profits that gives the author time to write, in addition to whatever Patreon they're doing, direct sales, like other ways of making money, regular sales. So, I mean, I think we have to look at sort of innovative, out-of-the-box ways of making a career, of selling books, and direct sales, like I'm doing direct sales on my website, you can buy ebooks, and I'm going to be doing signed paperbacks, which are a way to sort of take control of um, something in the career, not just rely on the retailers and the vagaries that they put you through. Things are always changing. But the idea of having actual investors who give you money up front, like a Patreon, but then take a percentage it's an idea. I mean, I haven't seen really a lot of people talking about things like that. So bringing back something like patronage, like what they had in the Renaissance, where just a rich person, or not in just the Renaissance, they've had it for a long time, uh, where rich people find value in supporting artists and giving them money and then either owning the art or taking a percentage of the profits. There are downsides to that. Zora Neale Hurston comes to mind. Like I know that there was this rich white lady, I don't remember her name, who funded a lot of her research, but then had exerted a lot of control over what she did, over what she published, what was said, and it turned out to be, seemed, seemed like a terrible situation. And I know there are many other stories like that. So, I mean, as long as you're upfront about, okay, if there is some sort of big venture capitalist angel investor giving you money and taking a percentage, they do not get any sort of editorial control over what you're doing. They can't, they don't have a say in anything. That would be the only way that this could work. And then our books, our authors, a good field for this? Maybe? I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's something interesting to think about because as we're looking at things like NFTs, which uh, I know that like someone like Joanna Penn, who I listened to, is very excited about NFTs. I think I was reading an article by someone who was involved in like the creation of the technology who brought up a very good point that I hadn't heard people talk about before where it's like I'm going to attempt to <laughs> attempt to explain the basics of NFTs if you're not familiar with it I'm sure I'm, I'll do a bad job I mean Jordan Penn calls it like digital editions or digital special editions so it's just another way of creating a special unique digital product that you can chase, uh, trace the provenance of. But this other person, who of course I don't remember, if I can find the article, I will link to it. It was just saying that it's still a file and the file has to live somewhere. 
So the file lives on a server and there's a link to the file on the server. Say you pay $2 million for an exclusive JPEG of this artist, right? And you get the file and it lives on a server. And supposedly it's yours forever, but the server might go down, the link might change, they don't renew their domain name and now the link is broken. Like there are all kinds of issues because the NFT does not hold the actual file. It's not, it's not big enough. It's very small, you know, basically text files, very small bits of information that only link to the file that you've purchased on its hard drive, wherever it lives on its server. So that is a huge problem that uh, is yet another thing. Aside from me just not getting it, like I've listened to a lot of podcasts, I've seen news reports, I still don't get it. I don't get it. I'm a tech person. I love technology. I love gadgets. I love things like that. I don't get it. I don't get it. (laughs) So... Until I get it, there's no way I'm doing any sort of NFT thing. Uh, But this is a big barrier in terms of my thinking. Anyway, innovative things for artists to make money and make a living and share their art. And uh, I think everything should be explored or at least thought about and talked about. And yeah. So my goals are to get my two chapters a week on this 1830s project. I need to just write a synopsis for the Orbit book too. I've been trying to really just make sure I have a handle on everything. And I don't think I'm going to have a handle on everything about the story until I actually get into the writing. So what I need to do is give a synopsis to my editor to just get the sign off and start writing, which is what I want to do in February. As soon as I finish this 1830s project, I'm diving right into the Orbit book too. I'm really excited about it. It's just everything is slow. My brain is slowed down, I think, or something unique about these projects like every book is different even though I I have a much better handle on my own creative process each book has its own needs and apparently its own timeline and so I'm doing my best to wrangle it into my timeline and we are gonna have to duke it out I guess (laughs) but yeah those are the goals and they continue with the marketing of Savage City So if you're listening to this episode the day it drops, it's MLK Day. And uh, yeah, we'll be singing Happy Birthday, (laughs) the Stevie Wonder version, and, you know, meditating on, on freedom, hopefully. And I will talk to you next week. For episode show notes and to sign up for the Footnotes newsletter and get the show notes in your inbox, go to myimaginaryfriendsshow.com, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and watch the video episodes on YouTube. I would really appreciate a rating or review to help support the show, and My Imaginary Friends is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more fantastic podcasts, go to frolic.media slash podcasts. <laughs>